but they never go back to having a good relationship. I feel so sad for Egwene, but I also kind of see how their stories take this parallel path where Rand mm. for a while feels like he has to become hard, like Queen DR, like Stone Rand, like Hard Rand. And Egwene gets, I'm just gonna say, like brutalized so many times. Oh my god, yeah. Where she kind of almost takes the similar path where she toughens herself up. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting that this is the moment where things branch off for them. Mm -hmm. And it's sad. We know how things end up and it's just, I don't know, it's sad. It's bittersweet. Mm -hmm. I hate, I hate seeing Egwene cry. It yeah. made me feel sick. Like, I don't know why. It's just, I don't even like Egwene that much. And in this moment, I was just like, girl, like, I just want to give you a hug. Mm -hmm. I want to sit on the couch and eat ice cream with you. Right. But I, I don't think that this is her completely being upset at losing Rand. I think that she's a long way from home. It's mm -hmm. all kind of hitting her at once. She's mm -hmm. going to Tarvalin. Her life is starting a new chapter and she's mm -hmm. really leaving everything behind. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think that has a lot to do with it too. Like watching Rand walk away is basically like watching her expected future walk away. I mean, she might not even know why she's crying right now. Yeah. It's just being hit with so many things. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. I sometimes cry on vacation even when I'm happy. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, it's Faldara stressful. sounds like a great vacation. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even get to have their feast. You know, I was actually Again. kind of looking forward to that. Yeah, Again. no Beltine, no feast for the Amaralyn. God, those Trollocs are the worst party crashers ever. Mm -hmm. Speaking of party crashing, again, just I love these little attentions to detail. The women's quarters in Faldara don't have real windows. Yeah. They, have they have arrow slits with cute curtains. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I just about guarantee that most of those women in the women's quarters could pick up a bow and arrow and use those arrow slits too. I wonder. They I seem wonder. like they seem like that kind of bunch. One of the things that Swan and Moraine talk about in the very beginning of chapter five is the possibility of being stilled. And they discuss what has happened to Amarillans in the past and that they usually end up being like scullery maids more or less. Mm -hmm. And Swan says, no one can rally around a woman who must scrub floors and pots all day. And I'm like, Oh really? Really Swan? No one? Because that's exactly what a queen does later on. It's alluding to being stilled, mm -hmm. and it's also giving us, like, history flashbacks of Tetsuan mm -hmm. and some Bonwin? of these other Amerlins. It's funny because Swan gets stilled, and she's right there helping command, and they eventually kind of, like, lead a war party out into the steps of Tarvalin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Swan isn't just sitting around knitting. She's <laughs> leading shit. She's yep. getting stuff done. Yeah. So. Internal thought from Moraine. Yet the world will burn, Swan, one way or another. Whatever we do, you could never see that. I feel as though in this moment, moment, excuse me, Moraine is, like, the pessimist. And Swan is the optimist. When they moved to talking about Rand being the dragon reborn and like what the consequences of allowing Rand to be the dragon reborn will be. And Swan is kind of like, well, as long as we guide him, everything is going to be fine. And Maureen is like, even if we try to guide him and we've seen that that's barely Not possible. possible the world is still going to burn. People are still going to die. There is still going to be tragedy in abundance. But I see it too from Swan's point of view mm -hmm. where she's literally been sitting around waiting right. for word from Moraine mm -hmm. and she gets nothing. So she's probably still in that 
place of like, okay, we found him and excited about it. Like, this is good. Mm-hmm. But Moraine has been trekking all over the Westlands with him. Yep. <laughs> pulling her hair out. Like, no, it's not so good. Right. Trust me. Yeah. Anytime Eamon Valda is mentioned, I just kind of want to throw up a little bit when Jeff- Joffrey Bornhold is thinking about his son he's thinking about how overzealous he is and i'm just wondering what kind of e- influence even valda must have had on dane bornhold while they were together was his fear founded on reality you know what i mean because i mean he doesn't ever find out his he dies by the end of the book well Joffrey has something against questioners in general mm-hmm. He thinks they're, like, beneath him. And then Dane Bornhold just goes nuts after his dad dies. So I feel like maybe maybe he just needs a new daddy. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe he's looking up to people that he shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, (laughs) I do. I don't understand when the questioner that meets up with uh yeah says he uses this reasoning that there's no central oversight for the villages around them he's like the best that any of them have as a village council or possibly a mayor and his brain just makes this leap that that means that there are dark friends there but it also leads me to think of like their time in the two rivers later on because the two rivers is set up the same way. They have a mayor, they have a village council, but they don't necessarily I think this just means that it's easy pickings. Like they yeah. chose this village specifically because there's no pushback. Yeah, there's, there's not no gonna, military. Yeah, there's there. not going to be some king's army that's going to come save this particular village. I love this chapter because reading it, I was like, yes, my white cloak conspiracy. <laughs> it just feels so spot on because Bornheld is talking about Morgays being toppled. Mm-hmm. So this is probably why the white cloaks were passing through the forest and eye of the world, which we had talked about before. Mm-hmm. They're trying to enter Camelin unnoticed. Mm-hmm. And then this is followed by Bornhold being told to sneak a legion of soldiers into Terabon. And this mm-hmm. is about 2,000 soldiers. Mm-hmm. So Joffrey says, yeah, maybe 50 or 100 could enter without question. Right. There's a lot of questions going on in my head about how exactly this white cloak approach into Terabon is going to be handled yeah yeah i do like this talk about terabon mm-hmm. and kind of the strange things happening on toman head because we know that these reports of the strange things happening on toman head mm-hmm. are true it's the shanchen and again this questioner is telling bornhold that there's female channelers and it's the Domani. Mm -hmm. Domani. However you say it. It's interesting how we get this first look into Yakim Karadin. Mm -hmm. So we've got a dark friend pushing these white cloaks into Terabon. Mm-hmm. So... I mean, this, this is his directive from Baalzaman. Right. Know? So Bornhold right. is like, who's, who's pulling the strings? And I'm like, the dark one! The dark yes. one's pulling the strings! It has been a really long time since I read the books, like, for the first time. And... I am fairly certain that the first time I read this, I did not think about Lyandrin being Black Aja. But I also don't think that I was alerted fully yet until mm-hmm. like she mentions it and she's like, of the Black Aja you've heard. She comes at the Lady Amelisa and it's almost like this extra fervent servant of the light 
almost when she's like do you serve the light my daughter or whatever and she's like trying to help her with lord algamar like there's definitely something conspiratorial about the way that she's behaving but i didn't necessarily think that she was a dark friend in that moment did you yes yeah you like had her pegged immediately this is a this is a dark friend yes yeah okay i i did not trust her at all she's projecting hardcore we mm -hmm. know she's a dark friend and then she's accusing the lady amelisa of being a dark friend mm -hmm. it's just like yeah oh, whatever yeah her like whole power trip throughout that entire thing is so frustrating she's always looking for power when she's talking about this compulsion weave that she can't do mm -hmm. properly she's like how hard sh she tried to make that particular weave be more than what it was and then mogidian shows up and is like hey by the way this is what it should look like i think i don't really love her as a character because she feels so black and white mm, yes like mm -hmm. there's That's no actually what I like real about her. grayness <laughs> to her well it's just I feel like it makes her a bad villain mm -hmm. where it's just like, oh, OK, like she's very she's kind of got like, yeah, it's yeah. just like she's got one quality about her. Is and this, it's like, is this lazy writing on Jordan's part? <laughs> no, because he has so many thousands of characters. Truth. But I think just this early in the beginning, he had to give us someone that was a baddie. Mm hmm. And this is and, who it ends up being. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's compulsion botched. Like that moment where she finds Rand and she's trying it on him and he's explaining the agony that he's going through. Like she's obviously not oh. approaching this with a delicate touch. You know what I mean? But it worked though. It works, but it's faulty. Like she had to go through all kinds of things to get amelisa knocked off balance and i know with like rand she never got to do that like there was never that moment where she was like able to break him down mentally and i think that's one of the reasons why he was able to push her off so hard besides just being like two rivers stubborn you know okay compared to one of the forsaken it's shit right but <laughs> but i think she got amelisa oh yeah completely in her grips mm -hmm. and then Amelisa went to all of her maids and had them hunting Rand out like sniffing him out mm -hmm. so it it worked pretty well I would say yeah I, I wouldn't say that it's ineffective it certainly does the job but again compared to one of the forsaken compared to what they can do it's it's so paltry it's, well, I mean Grendel... Gideon doesn't have to do that yeah. Grendel is, yeah. like, the worst. Grendel's great at it. She's like, hey, I'm just going to erase your whole mind and replace all of your thoughts with nothing that's but worship she, for me. That's why she has lower... Um, <laughs> Cut dresses? Yeah. It's a she just wears tactic. lower... Yeah, for compulsion. <laughs> like boobs compulsion look over here yeah <laughs> we did discuss how robert jordan was potentially a boob man um, yeah maybe leandrin just needs a push-up bra and <laughs> she can get that going at the end of this chapter pod and Fane is released from his cell his cell and he's like oh you're not who i expected and of course for me the question is who were you expecting so I went in and I checked. It's confirmed that Ingtar was the one who released Fane from his cell. Fane probably wouldn't know that Ingtar is a dark, a dark friend, friend yeah. until he lets him out of his cell. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was just like, oh, it's you. Mm -hmm. Like, you're the dark friend who's here to let me out. Mm -hmm. Not like I was expecting someone else. Not it. everything needs a theory. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm lying. Give them all to me. <laughs> I do I love like, it. I do like that it was Ingtar. Ingtar is one of my favorite side characters just because of what we get from him. Like, he is the opposite of Landrin when it comes to dark friends. Like, mm -hmm. he's like, I'm going to kill all of the Trollocs and I'm going to take on this fade. And I'm. Yeah, but a big do you ever soldier. feel like that's just a, a show? front? Yes, yeah. A little. Like, I'm, I'm the 
I'm not a dark friend. See, I love killing exactly. trolls. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I do feel like that's there, but I also recognize in Shinar that that's kind of their entire existence in some ways like killing Trollocs and Rudral and this guy's just extra hype about it they don't have personalities they're just like <laughs> we kill Trollocs that's everything to them One that is my personality <laughs> that's the reason why I am I mean that's what he says that's what he says in the eye of the world killing Trollocs that is why I am I didn't really have a lot to talk about chapter six, so I'm just going to go right into the meat Do of it, it all. I want to talk about Varen. Mm. So this is a chapter <laughs> that I have gone back and read and reread probably three or four times. Yeah. And in this moment... It is when we learn that the Horn of Valier has been taken. Moraine is in the room with Varen and Swan, and this is the quote from the book. Mm -hmm. Moraine gave the brown sister a wry look. Mm -hmm. So she's looking at Varen. Mm -hmm. She then speaks to the people in the room, which is Varen, then we must find the dagger, sister. We must find the dagger. Mm -hmm. Agomar is sending his men to hunt for those who took the horn and who slew his oath men, and the same who took the dagger. If we find one, we'll find the other. Mm -hmm. And then Varen nodded. Mm -hmm. Looking at this very short piece, Moraine, it, it could be argued that Moraine is sending Varen to go look for the horn and the dagger, mm -hmm. right? And then we get the moment where Varen shows up and says, Moraine sent me. So I would like to propose that Varen did not lie. Ooh, she didn't lie. Yeah, because she does. She just used her eye to eye twisting of what was said. Maureen sent her. Yeah. When I first read it, I was like, oh, Varen's a liar. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, she's another, and we've got another dark friend on our hands. Yeah. I also had a comment about the dagger and Varen because she says that the dagger will corrupt those around them. And this definitely... I love that you brought this up. Oh, good. I This definitely makes you think of Fane and the White Cloaks later on. Does he have the dagger when he's in Emmonsfield, Fane? I think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe he's absorbed enough of the uh, the corruption of the the dagger that he himself is a corruptible or a corrupted yeah that's influence. what i that's what i was thinking uh -huh. like he's already so he's just an empty shell anyway so whatever that was there to corrupt would just fill him <laughs> up like a vase he's you know what i mean something than man all the time poor pot and he's fane a, yeah he's a corruption sponge <laughs> a, a leaky <laughs> corruption sponge gross I'm picturing it being like dirty, gross, dark water too, because it's pot. Oh, and like like know? a dirty, dank, dank bar, and yeah. the bartender like wrings the dish water yeah. from the gross. dirty glasses out. Okay. That's fame. <laughs> I wonder if anybody else has described him that it way. Smells like Jägermeister <laughs> dirt <laughs> and gin. Yeah, and regretful twenty-year-olds. <laughs> Red Bull and X body spray. This is perfect. I hate him even more now. <laughs> That's so funny. So the passage on in my book, page 120, that refers to Luke and Insom Isom, excuse me. One did live and one did die, but both are. And I love this. This is such a tragic backstory and i feel as though it's one of those like little ones that be is like breadcrumbs that gets dropped throughout the series and you have to piece it fully together yourself and this was something that went 
completely over my head yeah. on my first read. Yeah, because it's I'm just like, a bunch Lord of Luke, names. Who? Yeah. Esam, who? T- they're two. T-Grain they're who? one. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Who are they? Why is this important? Why? Why should I care? But who they become is just so fascinating like the the slayer character this combination of two individuals to one individual who kind of can yes. switch back and forth is creepy it's creepy it but it's cool and i really like it and i love that it's in this prophecy so this whole dark prophecy from varon is fascinating there are so many things about it that we could probably talk about especially since she's black aja like i have to wonder if Varen also has access to some sort of weird dark archive out there because she's also Black Aja. It almost feels like this would be something Varen would join yes. the Black Aja to get access to. So, like, I agree. She's de- so she can decipher Trolloc script or whatever. Yep. I mean, yeah. It's it's really dumb. Like, it's an <laughs> awful idea. But but. Or maybe she was trying to decode it, looking for some archive or something, gets caught and was like, uh, no, I'm here because I love the dark one. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> and then just got stuck in it. I think that'd be really fascinating if there was some sort of weird library at Shale Ghoul or something that we don't know about. If she had her own story, it would be more fascinating than her story in, like in the Wheel of Time. Like I her think backstory that's what I is like more so much about her. She gets kicked out of farmatting. And she has for writing out. graffiti. Is that what it is? Yeah. It is? They were like, no, we hate you. Your graffiti sucks. <laughs> this is according to Pips on Twitter. <laughs> this is our theory. Well then it's we canon. Had a, <laughs> we had it sealed to the, I don't remember if it was sealed to the stable or sealed to the tower. It was one of the sealed to the meetings mm-hmm. on Zoom. And we were talking about what did Farron do in farm- farmatting to get kicked out. Right. And the unanimous answer was like <laughs> graffiti. <laughs> it was like, this town sucks. <laughs> And they're like, get out of here, you thug. So no subtle ruffian. No subtle Banksy kind of art. <laughs> <laughs> Just straight up. This town sucks. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what? We should let's plug that because you know why? Because it's why? nice. If you're a listener and you don't do it and you would like to talk to some Wheel of Time fans. Yeah. Like actually talk to them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and you don't even have to talk. Some people just hang out on the phone and listen to other people talk. Mm -hmm. You can lurk. If you think this is something that sounds like fun, just get a hold of us or get a hold of Pips or Mm -hmm. Snakes Snakes and Foxes foxes. on Twitter. Yeah, and they can can lead you in the right direction. Yeah. The conversation direction. Because, I I mean, when we chatted with Zach last week, one of the things that, like, really touched me was that he was like this is the first time I've been able to have a conversation with someone about Wheel of Time (sighs) and I think there are a lot of people out there like that like I know for me anytime somebody mentions that they read the series I'm just like (gasps) yeah Mm -hmm. let's talk about it yeah finding people who love this series is like oh we're best friends now (laughs) knock on their door can I talk to you about our lord and savior the dragon (laughs) knock 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 have you just heard want to shout it to the world? Randall Thor, mm-hmm. Nine Valmira. But I think we can wrap it up. I've got nothing else really that I. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> cool. 